Well, this is a late midweek update uh, recorded on Thursday at about 2.35, 2.45 p.m. in the afternoon. I'm just going to cover a few topics. Uh, some of these are a little bit of a preview of what I'll talk about on Sunday or fleshing out a little bit what I talked about or didn't talk about last Sunday. I'm going to call, call this the conflicts are gascalating, and I think you understand why I say that in just a moment. So here are some of the channels we're on, uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel on YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, Real FBC on Rumble, Remnant Truth Network, rtntv.org. I talk a lot, as you know, about the convergence of events and how quickly things are happening. And as I was trying to sift through to put this in a um, less than five-hour format, uh, it really has become a very, very difficult task. I know there's a lot of other people that do this that, that say the same thing. There are just really a lot of things going on in the world right now. It is a very turbulent war, uh, world. I think it's a world that you could say that it's a world at war. Uh, there's wars being fought on a number of different levels. You have economic war. You have sanctions against Russia. Uh, you have the Ukraine-Russia physical battles. You have Israel and Iran are really getting into it. And I'll talk about the ukraine Russia war impact, how it relates to the Middle East, and then some things in the Middle East for most of this um, little update. So uh, we talk about, as I said, the convergence of events, the acceleration, the convergence, uh, the things that have to happen for these things in Bible prophecy to actually come about, uh, and the fact that we're getting closer to the end uh, you know, is indicative of the time that we're going to get to a time where uh, men will understand. <coughs> we're going to get to a time where men will have better understanding about how these things are going to exactly work out. We're, we're still in the stage where there's a lot of um, reasonable speculation. There's some really outright crazy speculation but I think things will get clearer as we get closer to that exact time when these things are actually going to be fulfilled. Uh, it is a time like, uh, you know, I've been talking about this for 25 years, and we always used to have a little bit to talk about each week, and now it just seems like it just has exploded uh, with things to talk about. And we talk about the, you know, this argument that goes on, are the horsemen riding, or are they not really... Uh, are they just mounting up? I think we can certainly say they're mounting up and they seem to be getting ready to go uh, because there's a lot of things that are kind of coming together right now. So let me talk about a few things. One thing, and I may do an update tomorrow on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, did issue a decision today. They've not yet issued the decision on the abortion cases. So that's the one that I think everybody is kind of waiting for everybody's anticipating that i'm surprised the supreme court didn't rule earlier uh, or sooner i thought they would have ruled sooner but it, it, maybe they're doing it so that they'll it'll be the last thing that they issue their ruling the term ends on friday the 24th and they'll just leave town and they don't want to be anywhere around um town when that happens because there's been a lot of threats on their their lives it's really pretty egregious and i don't see the attorney general or the administration doing anything about it it's it's absolutely appalling uh so they did issue a decision today on a second amendment decision there was a new york law that re if you're going to get a concealed carry permit and people outside the united states may not understand sort of the mentality of americans as to americans and guns and that sort of thing and that's fine um but it's sort of embedded in our DNA as Americans, I think, the Second Amendment. But there are people that don't like it. And there are problems with it. There's, there's a trade-off. There's a risk-reward with having that kind of rights in your Constitution. So in New York uh, State, New York City, they wanted to put in place a law that made it difficult for somebody to get a concealed carry permit. Now, this varies widely across the United States. This is for people who don't live here. So, for example, uh, in a state of Ohio like where I live, you used to have to take a test and do a proficiency uh, exam and that sort of thing to be able to go and apply for a concealed carry permit. 
you had to go to a certified instructor and that sort of thing. Now they've really rolled that back in Ohio. In some states, they don't really have it. New York had pretty restrict, pretty strict rules. California does as well. But I think as of the ruling today, those uh, strict rules on getting a concealed carry, you had to show really good reason why you needed to have a concealed carry. I think those laws are now unconstitutional. So this is a big victory for Second Amendment rights. But it's interesting. I saw this guy on Twitter. It just popped up on my Twitter feed, and I thought, this is kind of strange. Does this person not know how to reason? And I looked him up, and he's a, a prof- I think he's a graduate of Georgetown Law. He's worked at big law firms in Washington, D.C. He's actually been an assistant solicitor general of the United States. And these are the people that go into the Court of Appeals, into the Supreme Court. They're usually highly skilled Um and they go in and they actually argue the case in front of the court. And it's a there's a very small um, group of people that are really well known for doing that. Um, and it's it's an honor to get to on, to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court. But in obviously I never have, but and I never will. But it's just. You wonder where the, the, we've come to this place where people just can't reason anymore. So the Second Amendment is in the Constitution of the United States. And it's pretty clear what it says, but people are always trying to pick at it. The Roe case, or the, the Dobbs decision that's coming out of the, on the Mississippi case that should come out tomorrow, it is the right to an abortion is not in the Constitution. When Roe was decided, they said that they had found the right in the penumbras, in the shadows of the Constitution. And it doesn't really exist. And this guy went to law school. He knows this, but he said this. Going to be very weird if Supreme Court ends the constitutional right to obtain an abortion next week, saying it should be left to the states to decide, right after it just imposed a constitutional right to conceal carry of firearms, saying it cannot be left to the states to decide. But the one is in the Constitution and the one is not. And the fact that he cannot, it just shows the, the, the lack of reasoning that is existent in our society today. So we're still going to have these problems. Uh, I'm still reading a lot about uh, power outages, drought. Uh, this is Lake Mead in uh, Las Vegas, just... Uh, Um, the water used to be where that person is standing. It's just incredible. And so major power sources for people in the Southwest are Lake Powell, Glen Canyon Dam at Lake Powell in southern Utah, and then in Nevada, Lake Mead, uh, both on the Colorado River, both behind huge hydroelectric dams. And they're really, uh, Lake Powell's already to the point where they cannot generate power from that dam is my understanding i don't think there's been rain over the past week or so to to change that and they're in the midst of a 1200 year drought lake mead is still generating power but my understanding is it's getting very very close so i um i'll just make a couple comments about ukraine uh it's one of these things where you whatever you say somebody's going to be upset with you um So this is an article in the Wall Street Journal the other day uh, talking about that Russia is losing a lot of troops in Ukraine, and it's putting a strain on their manpower. Now, look, Russia is, uh, their economy is the size, is is smaller than the combined economy of the the United States, states of Texas and Florida. Uh, They, Russia has about 144 million people. They have a massive demographic problem. Uh, The United States would as well if we didn't have immigration. Uh, Most Western nations have have demographic problems. China has a demographic problem that's just enormous. Uh, Japan is already losing hundreds of thousands off its population each year because they're just not having babies. And eventually this catches up with everyone. And so this is one of the reasons, one of the things I talk about some on the demographics is I think this is why some of these things we read about in the end times may happen now because we're in a period of human population decline that outside of a plague or something like that we've never really seen in human history and one of the countries that has the biggest demographic decline in fact their own newspapers have said it's the largest demographic decline 
of any country in human history that the most rapid decline is the nation of Iran. And we know that Iran really figures prominently. It's the Persia of Bible prophecy. And it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out over time. The other thing that's happening is that uh, there, because of the Ukraine-Russia war, there's some other factors that were leading up to it. So when, when you hear President Biden uh, or the vice president of the United States or whoever's in the regime that runs things in Washington, they say that this is Putin's price hike. This is caused by Putin. The inflation, even Gerald Powell of the um, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, Bank yesterday said, now this this stuff was this inflation was out there before the war in Ukraine. It's made it worse in some respects. But one thing that's made worse is the food shortage. So you have this perfect storm. We've had um, the pandemic, the lockdowns, the supply chains, the shutdowns, the lack of demand, getting things back, the demand coming back, things being, and it's just this huge pressure on supply chains. But one of the things that's going to really be impacted by the Ukraine war is the uh, supply of wheat. Uh, Russia and Ukraine produce about 30% of the world's wheat. Uh, there's millions of tons of wheat that is locked up in Ukraine. They can't get it out. They've planted, but now they're getting ready to harvest. They don't have the fuel to harvest. They don't have, you know, there's, it's just not safe in some of the areas of the country. So this is a this is a very very big problem. Um, so there's a lot of solutions. You know, here's a guy in the New York Times saying, "Well, we really need to get a naval blockade. We need to do this, this. We need to do really bad sanctions on Russia." This is in today's or yesterday's Wall Street Journal. It just doesn't seem to be anything that anybody can do right now. And Russia has in the past, under the so when it was the Soviet Union, did use food as a weapon. There were, I think history shows, millions of people starved to death, uh, or starved to death by the Russian, by the Soviet regime, um, back before World War II. Could have been as many as uh, three or four million people. And people use food as a weapon. Well, now the problem is, you know, that it's a world that uh, is heavily globalized. Uh, I see fruit and vegetables at my store from Peru and Ecuador. And um, goodness, I went last night, I saw melons from Tuscany. And I think, actually, to be honest with you, food that I'd never really seen before in any store in the United States that I've ever shopped in. There were there were some fruits, and I called Pam. I took pictures of them, and I sent them home, and I'm like, have you ever seen this thing? Never even heard of it. Um, and here we are in the midst of supply chain problems, and we have Tuscan melons at Costco. It just, it, there's sort of a disconnect here. But this grain thing is going to be a disaster. There are 50 million people in the world, at least at a minimum, that are on the verge of famine. And these people are on the verge of dying from hunger. And what's going on in Ukraine does not help anything. Now, the other thing that's related to the Ukraine issue is the gas. And that's why I chose the... Uh, the conflicts are gascalating. There, there's an escalation in conflicts, and it's going to be like this for a while. I think we're entering, if, if everything sort of tried to go back to a little bit of a semblance of normal, I just don't see how this thing recovers within 10 years. Uh, it's, it's very daunting, it ha and, and it is. And what Russia is doing is Russia has started cutting back on the gas that's going to Europe. Now it's summer, so they don't need as much gas, but usually what Europe does is they they buy they buy continue to buy gas and have it flow through the pipelines mainly from Russia. Russia supplies uh, 40 to 50% of Europe's gas on an annual basis. Uh, and they have places where they store it, so they store the gas so they can use it in the winter. So 
But now Russia's cutting, and you'll see a report here in just a second about Russia's cutting back on the gas supplies. And a lot of this is sort of the perfect storm again that has happened because of the way things have been done. I talked in a midweek update about, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, about ESM, Environmental, Social, and Governance, which is a social credit score for corporations. And this is pushed heavily by the Soviet, and I keep saying the Soviets, by the Russians uh, through funding of green groups around the world and by the, so, uh, by the Saudi Arabians. And these are the people who will benefit the most if other people don't produce as much gas or oil because then people will have to come to them for gas or oil. The price will go up. They'll make more money. And they're making a lot of money right now. Russia is making... Uh, maybe a couple billion dollars a month more than it was uh, for selling the same amount of gas and oil uh, just before the war started. So, and the sanctions have backfired. The other thing is, there's been this promise of green energy. So for example, in uh, Germany, they say, well, we get 40%, 46% of our power now comes from renewables. But the only reason that the percentage is that high is because they cut out all their coal-burning fire plants or coal-burning power plants. Now that they don't have the gas to generate, the, the, you need to ha have a constant supply of power. It always needs to be being generated. The uh, reliability of solar and wind, particularly in Germany, is just not that great. We saw what happened to Texas, which has a lot of oil and gas, but they've cut back on plants. Uh, power plants down there because they were going to do renewables and it just it just doesn't work there's a big shortfall well now even germany and now the the greens and the green parties in germany are just going crazy because germany has come out and said we're going to start up our old coal burning fire plants or power plants well now they're going to say well that's going to cause more pollution now everybody who's talking been talking about the environment for all these years is saying oh we're not going to make our 2030 goals we're not going to even make our 2050 goals because we're all going back to dirty fossil fuels. And the answer is, yeah, you need that for people to live um, and to have power and electricity. And then you have all the people in the third world that want to have electricity and air conditioning and that type of thing. So this is, this is a big pipe dream. But through this ESG nonsense, people are cutting back on power generation. And it's just you can see the problem that's hap happening. So even the EU comes out. They're in the midst of an energy crisis. They need to have power. They can't get the, what they need from Russia. They thought that they could get some things from the United States like liquefied natural gas. And that was working until we had a fire at the LNG plant uh, south of Houston. Uh, and, peop it's, and, it, and you just don't build an LNG plant overnight. You don't fix an LNG plant overnight. Um, it was a couple of years ago, by the way, I was reading an article this morning at Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys football team, probably the most valuable, maybe the most valuable sports franchise in the world. He, I think he bought the Cowboys for $140 million um, many years ago, 30 years ago. And it's worth billions of dollars now. Well, he made a bet. Uh, he invested about uh, $1.8 billion in LNG facilities and plants and wells, gas wells and that sort of thing. And he actually was up like $1.5 billion profit on that investment that he made last year. He would like almost doubled his money in a year. Now, he's, it's dropped back a little bit because the price of natural gas fell, even though there's a gas shortage uh it's sometimes the ability to get gas from point a to point b can't get the liquefied natural gas from the united states to europe because there's no plant to do it so um it sits here and it has to go into the market it's already been brought out of the ground so it needs to go into the pipelines in america so that increases the supply of gas and the price goes down it's it's simple supply and demand and I'll talk a little bit about that if I remember to when I get to talking about Israel. So here's just a little report from Sky News Australia about some of the things that are going on with regard to the Russia-Ukraine war and gas and food and that sort of thing.
Head of the International Energy Agency is warning European countries to prepare contingencies in the event Russia completely shuts off the gas supply to the continent during winter. Several countries have reported receiving significantly less Russian gas than what would be expected in the coming weeks. Russian officials claim the drop in supply isn't deliberate and are blaming technical issues. The IEA's executive director, Fatih Birol, is sceptical and believes the reduction is a strategic decision. Energy companies in Italy, Austria and Slovakia are all reporting significant drops in supply over the past fortnight. And that's only going to continue because Russia's cut back on the gas that's going through Nord Stream 1 pipeline uh, by 60%. This is a, a report from another uh, news agency. So that's, I don't see that's going to improve anytime soon. Now, Russia says, well, we, we need some su uh, supplies to repair the pipeline or to repair a pumping station, that sort of thing. And they said, but we can't get those because you put sanctions on us. And the sanctions are backfiring. So there's going to be a huge impact on Europe. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about one way that Europe's trying to replace the gas. But there's some logistical problems with that. It's, it's going to be uh, a big impact. Here is a, a German TV report about the problem a little bit. She sort of summarizes, plays a clip of Putin from the St. Petersburg um, economic forum that took place uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, just last week. Russia's slashing gas deliveries to European countries, including Germany, in what one German leader calls an economic attack. Citizens are tightening their belts as inflation surges, nowhere more so than in the global south, where Russia's blockade of grain shipments could plunge up to 50 million people into famine. Today, we're asking, no grain, no gas? Is scarcity Putin's weapon of choice? I would like uh, for all of us to listen to a recent claim made by Vladimir Putin that European and U.S. sanctions, which he referred to as an economic blitzkrieg, are actually hurting the West more than Russia. The European politicians have already dealt a serious blow to their own economies. Experts estimate that the total EU losses from the sanctions next year could reach as much as 400 billion US dollars. Inflation in certain countries has surpassed 20 percent. And Vendelina Putin went on to say that, in fact, uh, his government has stabilized Russia's financial system, its banking system, uh, its trade relations. And so one of the other panelists there, the gentleman on the panel, said, well, you know, things are fairly normal in Russia, but they do have about 15% inflation. And it may be that down the road, Russia's going to have problems. But clearly, everything has boomeranged. That led to this little uh, clip of a speech by President Xi of China yesterday talking about sort of the boomerang effect of the sanctions. It has been proved time and again that sanctions are a boomerang and a double-edged sword to politicize the global economy and turn it into the one's tool or weapon and willfully impose sanctions by using one's primary position in the international financial and monetary markets will only end up hurting one's interest and inflict suffering on everyone. Putin's even gone so far as to try to propose a a new G8, and I, I think, you know, you people who study Bible prophecy should be sort of interested with this. Now, I've not found this article very many places. I had to really dig for it. I found it in the National Post of Canada, Russia to form new G8 with Iran and China. Um, the Duma's head of state in Russia said this, the economies of the United States, Japan, Germany, Britain, France, and Italy, and Canada continue to collapse under the pressure of sanctions against Russia. The breakup of existing economic relations by Washington and its allies has led to the formation of new points of growth in the world. The eight countries that do not participate in the sanctions war are China, India, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Iran, and Turkey. Now, that's an interesting group of alignment, particularly when you get Russia, well, China, India, Russia, 
Iran and Turkey and Indonesia, uh, the largest, I believe, the largest uh, Muslim pop- country with the largest number of Muslims in the world. Uh, so this is very interesting the way this is. And Russia is selling oil like crazy to India and China. They, they're not missing a beat. And India and China are saying, we need the oil. We're, we're going to use it. So the sanctions have backfired. It's been, I would say, it's pretty clear that it's a debacle. Um, it's interesting that this was what one person said. This is Christia Friedland. She's the deputy prime minister and minister of finance in Canada. And she did a... Um, a press conference the other day with the Ukrainian finance minister. She's Ukrainian herself, I believe. Her family is Ukrainian. And she's one of these World Economic Forum graduates. And she said the G20 can't function effectively with Russia at the table. Uh, You can't be a poacher and gamekeeper at the same time. So there's going to be a G20 summit. Uh, Putin and Zelensky have both accepted uh, invitations to come to that economic summit in November. Kind of interesting. But this is looking like it could be a very dark winter for Europe. Europe is uh, on the brink uh, because of its gas supply. In fact, there's one other factor that's coming into the gas supply issue. Uh, As I was reading articles, I came across this, that Algeria, now Algeria is doing two things. They have a draft law criminalizing normalization with the Zionist entity, that's Israel, But they also were telling Spain, and I think they've backed off of this a little bit, a lot of Algeria gas goes to Spain. And they were telling Spain, don't you dare sell it to anybody else. If you sell it to anybody else, we'll cut you off completely. And I think that was in part because of Russian influence in this economic war back and forth. Now, one of the things that Europe has done to get gas is they have gone to... Israel. Israel has a lot of gas. Now, I've tried to research this, but I'll I'll give you an example. I believe that Algeria has about 160 trillion cubic feet of gas in the the, of gas reserves that they can sell in the future, recoverable reserves. Israel, as of last year, and they found some gas since. has about uh, six, seven, maybe eight trillion cubic feet. Europe uses in uh, on an average year about 155 billion cubic feet, and about I don't know, let's say 50 percent of that is imported. So let's say 80 billion cubic feet. So Israel has six to eight trillion cubic feet and they they could supply europe with a lot of gas and so the eu went and they signed an agreement to buy gas for from israel over the next seven to ten years and it's it's going to taper off after that because israel needs it for its own and israel's anticipating that it will grow um, so Israel, these are the gas fields that are in the Mediterranean. Some of those, the Zor field is a big field that's owned by uh, Germany. Uh, you have the Calypso, Aphrodite, that's uh, Cyprus. And then you have these, the Tannin, Leviathan, Tamar, Dolphin, and Karish fields that belong to Israel. Uh, so they want to take the gas from the Mediterranean to Europe. There's two ways to do that. You can load it on one of these big tankers like you see down there by Egypt. Uh, but it has, so they have to pipeline it. Now, there, there is a pipeline method to transfer by pipeline to Israel and then go down through the Negev to Egypt to the liquefied natural gas facilities that Egypt has. But the problem with that is that the gas facilities there's limitations on them they're not that big so you couldn't take all the gas that israel is producing or 80 percent of the gas that israel is producing and get it liquefied and then ship to europe because there's two problems you you don't have the the facilities in egypt that are capable of doing that and then you don't have the port facilities in 
Europe that are able to take the liquefied gas, regasify it, and then put it into the pipelines. There's a logistical problem. Uh, now, this can be overcome, but these things take a while to uh, come about. In fact, in one of the articles I read, this is a quote from one of the articles uh, that I, um, it was a defense-oriented publication. It said, in case of an embargo or other disruption, liquefied natural gas can be transported into Europe by sea from major pro producers such as the United States and Qatar. Qatar has the largest known gas field in the world. It shares it with Iran. And they have another one that they're just getting ready to open, and, and they're splitting it 80-20, but I don't know who's getting the 80 and who's getting the 20. Uh, but the problem with Cutter Gas is that Cutter has contracts, long-term contracts with people to supply gas. So they just can't say, okay, well, we're going to take the gas away from uh, India and we're going to sell it to Europe instead. That's just, you know, they have contracts. That's why people have contracts. So this is, this is what this article says. This could make up for some of the lost supply, but it would still be years before an LNG infrastructure large enough to replace much of the Russian supply could be in place. LNG, that's liquefied natural gas, will most likely be only part of the solution to Europe's problem. It normally takes upwards of two years to deliver a new LNG vessel, a tanker, and sufficient port capacity and other ground infrastructure are also required. On the positive side, existing LNG terminals in Europe have never been fully utilized and as much as half and were at as much as half a capacity and as much as half a capacity was idle in 2020. So that's that's but again to replace what they're the the massive amount that they're getting from Russia with liquefied natural gas from someplace else is a problem. Now, I've talked about this ad nauseum about the other solution is a pipeline. But that pipeline is estimated to take anywhere from 5 to 10 years to build and would cost at least 10 billion dollars. The United States has come out against that. The banks don't want to do this. Why? Because of ESG type mentality that's now embedded in everybody in business and banking. They can't get financing for a project like that. It's uh, not economically feasible. Now, they could take a pipeline up through Turkey, but then you have the political issues that are there. So this is not... Um, this is not going to be solved quickly and and i i know that some people think and and i'm not totally discounting it that the israeli gas is the hook in the jaw that russia comes after at some point right now russia doesn't need it because they're selling everything that they can take out of the ground they're selling it to china and india the two most populous nations on the planet um and we're creating a multipolar world uh, that will ultimately benefit Russia and and that sort of thing. So it's a very complicated problem. So here's an article. This is from the Atlantic Council. Now, this is kind of a, a globalist organization. Uh, they want to get peace in the Middle East, and they're now talking. This is an article that they just published uh, last week. Um and when you see something like in that title, see M-E-N-A source, that means Middle East, North Africa, MENA. Uh, when there's some talk in the Trump administration and even now about an Arab NATO, and they a lot of times they'll use the term MENA, which means Middle East, North Africa. Lebanon, Israel, maritime border dispute picks up again. So here's what happened. So... We have these gas fields. Um, this is this is the uh, uh, a picture of the Lebanese version of where the maritime border should be. Here's here's a little bit of a picture in English. So you have Lebanon there, and you have Israel to the south, and you have these. So the question is, where does the border? The border is extended out into the ocean. And so what's the direction of the border? Does it go sort of angled uh, more towards the north? So do you use line 1, 23, or 29? Israel is contended, and there's been this dispute that, uh, well, we have uh, line 1 is the proper line. And this is being mediated by the United States and a guy named Amos Hochstein. He was a 
sort of the East Med gas guy in the uh, Obama administration, and he is in the O'Biden administration. Uh, Lebanon came out and said, no, 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 wait, no, no, no. The, you're, the, ang- the angle of the border shouldn't go like that. It should go more, sh- not quite as far to the north. So we, we proposed line 23. Now, part of that is because there's this gas field, the Kana Sidon, you might recognize the name Tyre and Sidon from the Bible, the Kana Sidon field. That's there. You see it in block nine. And so 23 is the uh, is where the border should be. And so they've been negotiating. And part of it is how they're going to divide up the gas that comes from the gas field that crosses the maritime border. And usually people would sit down and hammer it out just like Iran and Qatar did and say, we get 80%, you get 20%, and everybody's happy. Um. The problem is that they've now found this Karish field. And so as, as soon as the Karish field was found, the Lebanon said, oh, no, no, wait a minute. We, we, did we draw line 23? No, no, we, we meant to draw line 29. That's really where the border says so they've, they've submitted this proposal. And you can see the gas field there. And then just to the south of it, you see the Karish field. Uh, which nobody, everybody knows, has not been in any of the disputed maritime boundaries. So Israel can go ahead and develop that, you would think. But uh, Nasrallah made a speech on June 10th, uh, and he makes these long, if you think my things are long, you got to try to wade through one of Nasrallah's speech or the two or three that he might give in a given week. Sometimes they're two and a half hours long. Um, so I guess count your blessings, right? So Nasrallah gives a speech. Now, some people say, is it a threat? Was he threatening Israel or was he not? And there's, there's a lot of back and forth in the Israeli press about whether he was threatening Israel in that speech. But he said, listen, uh, don't you dare drill out there. We have, you know, drones and we have missiles and that type of thing. And we can attack your offshore drilling facilities uh if you don't do that now some people said well he didn't really say that he said uh it's the opinion of the resistance that you guys shouldn't be drilling out there uh but he did sort of indicate that well this should be up to the lebanese government to decide but the problem is you can never trust the lebanese government government to do anything or to come to any decision and for years they've been going after this line 23 now they're saying it's line 29. So there was a development. So this is Nasrallah's speech. And so this was an article uh, in the Jerusalem Post the other day saying that, look, the president of Lebanon and, and their government's in a total state of turmoil. I mean, Israel, Israel's government just uh, dissolved. They have a caretaker prime minister. They'll have uh, the fifth round of elections in the last three years in October, November. Um, Lebanon is, is even worse. I mean, you, you look at the way the Lebanese parliament is constructed and you think that whoever devised the Israeli parliamentary system is a genius uh, by comparison. So they, they never have a government and they have to have so many Christians and so many Shiites. And it's it's just Hezbollah has had effective control of the government for a while. But this is kind of interesting. This is just a new development. Lebanon's President Michael Anoun met with U.S. mediator Amos Hochstein, the special envoy of U.S. President Joe Biden, and presented his country's position, which includes a compromise. According to one report, Anoun did not submit any written proposal to Hochman, but told him the details of what he wanted to do. And what they said was, we're not going to insist on line 29. We can live with line 23, but we gotta. We want everything in the Kana Sidon block or gas field. So nobody, uh, nobody knows whether exactly what's going to happen. Um, Anun did make it clear that they were not going to raise any claims with respect to the Karish field, which is a big change and. What happened, you might remember, I think I have sort of the 
this uh, over here near Israel, this big FPSO from Ener Ener Energy and Energy Power Company had gone through the Suez Canal up here to drill the Karish field. And that's when all of this thing started to heat up. And Hezbollah was making all these threats. We're going to send missiles out there. We're going to send drones out there. But it may be that Hezbollah just does not want to engage in a battle with Israel right now, especially when you look at all the other things that are going on. So now let's look at some of the other things that are going on. And I'll try to... Obviously, I can never keep these things sh short, but I'm doing the best I can, folks. <laughs> um, so this is an article uh, a week and a half ago in The Economist. It was, it's very interesting um, um, paper or magazine. You know, it's, it's, it's European globalists, bankers, that type of thing, put this out. And they always do that predictive issue each year. And then they did the one about uh, the coming global uh, wheat or famine catastrophe uh, where they had the wheat shocks that look like the shocks of wheat look like skulls. So they had an article a couple of weeks ago and they actually did a interview with Naftali Bennett, who at the time, uh, and he may still be for a little bit of another few hours, he is, was, may still be the prime minister of Israel. He gave an interview to The Economist. And in The Economist, I think this is the first place that this appeared, he talked about the doctrine that they now have that's going to govern their relations with, relations with Iran. And he said, we are implementing the octopus doctrine. Uh, we no longer play with the uh, tentacles with Iran's proxies. We have created a new equation by going for the head. Uh, so he talked about this. He's been in office for about a year. Here's what the article says. In the past, Israel aimed its attacks on Iran almost exclusively at its nuclear program and scientists connected with it. When Israel hit other Iranian targets, such as the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and its Expeditionary Quds Force, it intended to do so in third countries, such as Syria. Now it is attacking the IRGC inside Iran as well. In February, it stuck, struck a factory making drones for the guards in western Iran. In May, it assassinated one of their commanders in Tehran, Iran's capital. And there have been a number of other assassinations. In fact, I just saw a, a tweet that one of the heads of one of the sections of the IRGC uh, was severely injured in an assassination attempt. There have been people who... You know, it comes out that he, he accidentally fell off the top of a building or something like that. And these, these are assassinations that have been taken apart or taken um, under by the Mossad. For example, in this article in The Economist, it says in April, Mossad, Israel's foreign intelligence agency, even aired a recording of a revolutionary guard being interrogated by Israeli agents, supposedly inside Iran. Not all members of Iran's security establishment are happy with this brash new approach, but it is part of the doctrine. So I think one thing you can say is that uh, the problems you have with a, the construction of the government that Bennett did, the compromises that were made, there does seem to be, in, in many respects, an overarching concern about Israeli security. But at some point that concern gets undermined by the compromises you're making on the political side. So Israel's going to go to elections. Uh, they are, I think the, the polling that I saw showed that Netanyahu was in the lead, but that nobody was able, was going to be able to form a long-term stable government, uh, which means it just seems like there's going to be these endless rounds of elections. Um, we're always in an election cycle. They're in Israel. They're always actually in an election cycle. So what you've seen is you've seen this escalation over the past few months between Israel and Iran. Part of that is because Iran has now gotten to the point where they are enriching uranium to 90%. They're very close to making a bomb. The breakout time for that anybody says from weeks to six to eight months. It's probably a little bit on the longer side because they've got to, you know, miniaturize it. They got to be able to put it on a missile. They have to have a missile delivery system. Uh, but it, 
the criticism of Israel's approach within Israel too is you guys are you're not you're sort of slowing them down, but not that much. I mean, we've been at this for years, hacking away at them, you know, killing this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy, and it's it's sort of like the multi-headed hydra. You you lop off one head, and here comes three more to replace it. So that's um, that's part of what's going on. So that sort of sets the stage for the next little part of this. So we have this laser. A uh, system called Iron Beam, and I've talked to you about this in the past. This is a a laser system that's designed to intercept missiles, mortars, that sort of thing. Now, it does unfortunately have limited range, so you have to have a lot of these all over or just in the right place. But it is very effective, and it's something that I I don't think that any other country has. Now, the concern, though, is what is Israel going to do with this? <coughs> and this was kind of an interesting article because I've seen all these reports about Iron Beam for a while. But now it says the Defense Ministry's laser interception system project will be presented to U.S. President Joe Biden during his visit to Israel next month, according to sources from the ministry and the IDF. The presentation will take place at the airbase when the president tours an Iron Dome battery. IDF sources said that the defense ministry was looking for partners for the project, which ha will have a high cost. Now, so what they want to do is they want to sort of farm this out, uh, get funding from America. And I think there are people within Israel that are rightly very concerned about how that is going to go. In fact, I think that Beck, uh, who wrote an article in Newsweek, interesting Newsweek is publishing some articles from very good uh, conservative journalists. And she was talking about this in the context. I can't remember if she talked about this in the article or she was talking about it on a recent podcast. You should go to JNS, Caroline Glick Show, uh, and subscribe to her podcast youtube but it's also on apple Podcasts and that type of thing she always has a good guest on this week she had david goldman uh, i might play a little bit of that on sunday just always excellent well thought out articulate great thinking interviews with people and of course i agree with caroline caroline politically uh for the most part so i do like her i mean i i like what she has to say. I think she's a voice that is very important to listen to. Uh, so one of the things that I think she was expressed concern about was we're going to go to the Biden administration, which is doing all of these things to work with the Palestinians to undermine Israel. They want to put in place, for example, one of the ways that they've then, well, here it is in the second paragraph of her article on Newsweek. Earlier this month, the Washington Free Beacon revealed that the administration has decided to separate the Palestinian Affairs Unit from its embassy uh, to Israel and Jerusalem. The head of the unit will be an ambassador in all but name directly appointed by the Secretary of State and subordinate to him in the chain of command. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Today, in accordance with the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995, the head of the Palestinian section of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem is subordinate to the U.S. ambassador to Israel. So they're going to take it away from the, the Palestinian part, away from the ambassador in Jerusalem at the embassy, and put it over in some other kind of separate thing that answers directly to people at the Secretary of State in uh, Washington. And this is, this is to undermine uh, the authority. And so... As she says in this paragraph, the declared goal of the administration is to fulfill President Joe Biden's campaign pledge to open a consulate for the Palestinians in Israel's capital city. The move has been stymied to date by a strong congressional disapproval and by the fact that such a move is unlawful under both U.S. and international law unless Israel improve, improves it. But Israel vigorously opposes Biden's position, which it views as hostile to Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. And she's exactly right. But then the other thing that they're doing is they're trying to farm out this 
funding of Iron Beam, the laser system, and bring the United States in, which means you're going to have, before they can use it, it's going to, it's, if they do it this way and the U.S. makes demands like the Obama administration made on weapons systems before and other administrations have made on weapons systems, is you, you can't use it in certain circumstances. So this is very, very problematic as to um, uh, how this how this is going to be done. Now, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this. I will talk a little bit more about this on Sunday, uh, but I would recommend that you go read Seth Fransman's article from um, June, I think it was uh, last Friday, June 17th in the Jerusalem Post. Is Israel's not-so-secret stat- strategy against Iran a winner? And he asks some very good questions. Well, maybe I'll just go over this right now. Uh, so Israel has uh, Israel is escalating things against Iran. Uh, Israel secretly coordinates with the U.S. on many of the airstrikes it carries out in Syria as the Allies face a battlefield crowded with militant groups, Iranian-backed militias, and foreign militaries, according to current and former U.S. officials. American officials have said little about Israel's bombing missions, which have been aimed at interrupting Tehran's flow of advanced weapons to Lebanese Hezbollah and diminishing Iran's military forces and proxies in Syria. Um, So what's happened is that there has been a, and, and so there was this article, a couple articles in the, in the Wall Street Journal uh, recently, and Seth was responding to those in his article in the Jerusalem Post, and it said, U.S. reviews Israel's plans for serious strike. And so there was a map there in the, in the article about all the different strikes that Israel had made by missiles and drones and, and bombers in Syria over the past number of years. And it's been probably in the thousands of strikes. Uh, been a couple times that people have fired back. Russia sort of sent some thing, fired some things their way, but a lot of times they they pretty much clear these with Russia. And there was a thought, I think myself included, that Russia was going to be distracted by its war in Ukraine, and for in and for a while that appeared to be the case, but now the pendulum seems to have swung back the other way and Russia is actually sort of increasing its presence within Syria. Well, as they do that and as Israel gets more bold with its strikes, there's a chance that there will be an attack on a Russian position. So Russia sort of ramped up its presence in Syria. So that's representation of Syrian jets. So a week ago, uh, Yesterday, a week ago, yesterday, there were a number of Russians a strike uh, near uh, aircraft. Two um, bombers of one kind and one of another attacked near the Al Tamf garrison there in south and southern Syria along the Jordan border near the, where Jordan, Iraq, and Syria borders come together. And they also attacked some places up in northeast Syria, which is effectively under United States control. Um, so there's been um, this chance of interactions that are happening. Uh, another article by Seth was, you know, can Syria handle Israel's new octopus doctrine because they're going at the head? And what an impact is that going to have in Syria? Because the Syrian government is not super strong, but they effectively control a large portion of the country now, which they've also effectively destroyed. Now, Israel has come out, and this was a report that was in an Arab online newspaper called Elof that uh, very often will publish things that Israel is trying to communicate to its Arab uh, neighbors and enemies. And they said, listen, if you are... uh, uh, Assad, if you're if you're going to do this, we are going to bomb 
your palaces if i ran operations continue you need to do something you need to step in and take care of this and so this is just part of this really what i think is now a kinetic war between iran and israel they're not troops going back and forth but there's missiles and bombs and fighters and assassinations and just about everything other than troops getting mixing it up on the ground so that and this came after israel bombed the damascus airport which has been damaged enough that it's going to be closed down a few weeks but then people in israel say well you you bombed the airport in damascus but they're only going to close it for three weeks and you can actually see in the picture of this one article they're out there repairing the the uh, runway so uh, as Seth says in his article about this, uh, Syria's regime is already repairing the damaged tarmacs at the airport. This means that Syria is willing to go back to normal, but the regime is not retaliating. So you have this interesting thing is they, they complain about it, but they don't do anything in response. Israel goes and assassinates all these people, in Tehran, some in Tehran, uh, the head of the nuclear agency, Fazi Zaked, uh, last year. Uh, the Americans uh, took out uh, Soleimani uh, about two years ago. But there's not, a lot of times, not a direct retaliation by Iran. But now that may be changing too. And there were some reports this week. Um, here's this article from the Wall Street Journal that Russia last, last uh, Saturday Russia escalates Syrian operations. Uh, and part of this is, you know, the attacks in, on the, at the Al-Tanf garrison, that's to send a message to Israel. Now, there was this very interesting story that um, um, I've seen some other people talk about it. I was um, working on this yesterday and came across uh, this article, which was published in Milyad. It's a, a Turkish newspaper. And it's, it's very interesting. It almost reads like a, a, staunt, uh, a, a spy novel. So you see this Estambula da Kassilar Savasi. That essentially means war of spies on the streets of Istanbul. And this columnist has said, oh, I'll just read a, a couple paragraphs of it because it's kind of interesting. What, what was happening, just so you know the backstory is, that there had been reports, I think I may have talked about this last Sunday, that... Uh, Israelis were told to leave. Um, they were told to leave Istanbul. In fact, here's Israel Hayom. This is the publication from uh, June 15th, and they said, you know, don't go out in the markets. Don't wear any things that identify you as Jewish. Uh, don't speak Hebrew. Uh, probably you ought to come home. And there was. There were air flights that where people were taken, but some of the people were in a hotel, and they actually sent Mossad agents in, and they had to coordinate this was with the Turkish government uh, to uh, get the people out. So here's an article: Daily Sabah, Iranian cell planning attack on Israelis named named in Turkey, and then here's one of the uh, Turkish articles from the newspaper. Uh, but here is uh, just uh, let me read a f couple three paragraphs of this. Um, yesterday in Milyet, the Turkish newspaper Milyet. There was a great war of agents on the streets of Istanbul these days. The allegations started with the news that an Israeli tourist group walking in Beyoğlu was picked up by the Mossad in an armored minibus taken directly to the airport and flown to Israel. According to Israeli media, if the Israeli citizens in question, and this is a little bit awkward because this is a translation from the Turkish because I don't speak Turkish, but I use automatic translators available on the internet. According to Israeli media, if the, Turkey, if the Israeli citizens in question had reached their hotel, they would have come face to face with Iranian agents waiting for them there. A completely different picture emerged when the target people started to wonder who they were and started to poke around. The story actually begins in Iran. In the last month, very important names have lost their lives in Iran one after the other after Hassan Siad Koda, was killed, who was killed in, in Tehran, aviation expert Ayub Entazari, 
who was poisoned at the dinner he was invited to, and Kamran Malapur, who worked at the Natanz nuclear facility, also lost their lives. I think there was, and there's been a couple of others. There's also Colonel Eli, I won't even try to say his name, known as a key member of the Quds Force Unit 840, who is planning these assassinations of his, of Israelis, um, who is said to have died after falling from the roof of his house. <coughs> Sources opposing the Iranian regime, backed by the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, wrote that the deaths of two extremely important scientists who, were t who tried to be hidden from the public or to be portrayed as extremely important scientists were tried, uh, they tried to hide them from the public or be, uh, portray them as insignificant. And then some also said, well, this colonel who fell off the roof actually committed suicide because he was a suspect in an investigation into the Mossad assassinations. Where are they getting the intel? And so people were pointing the finger at this guy. So it's, it's very much of a, uh, very much of a spy novel type thing. So this is going on in the background, and this is this happened last week. But the news and everything was just coming out in the Turkish papers yesterday. And Turkey cooperated with Israel to get these people safe because it wouldn't have looked good for. And I think one of the people was a diplomat or the wife of a former diplomat ambassador from Israel to Turkey to have them kidnapped and that type of thing. But understand that this, uh, there's there's twofold thing that they're trying to do. They're trying to assassinate them in some cases, but they're also trying to kidnap them. And this is a concern of the Israeli defense forces as they look at what's going to happen in a next war with Lebanon, that there will be people that will infiltrate across the border and kidnap Israeli citizens, take them back through those tunnels and whatnot. And then we have hostage situations, which is, uh, Israel has a very strong opinion about what they're going to do if their citizens are hostages. Remember what happened at the raid at Entebbe in 19, July 4th, 1976, uh, when Israel went and rescued the hostages that had been held there for about a week uh, by Palestinian and German terrorists. So this is, and this is a big concern is about how are we going to handle this in the next war that takes place ha 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 so here is this is a report from al kabas newspaper in kuwait and sometimes what you'll see is you'll you'll find things about secret Mossad operations and that sort of thing they sometimes show up in these other newspapers like al kabas or this elof uh, website so this is the uh, and you can find it on the internet al kabas is published but um, Sunday, they had this article in the paper. And the title of the article was Mysterious Explosion West of Tehran. And what they talked about was there was this explosion that took place out at a um, missile factory. And, and so this is the Kuwaiti newspaper, which doesn't like Israel. There's no love lost between Kuwait and Israel. In fact, you'll see when I'll read you from the article, they don't even say the name Israel. They have another name for Israel. And it says this, the hidden war between the Zionist entity, that's Israel, and Iran has entered a new stage amid indications of a major shift in the Zionist strategy towards Tehran. After their previous efforts were focused on the Iranian nuclear program, the Zionist campaign against non-nuclear activities expanded and it is a new development and a major escalation and not just a tactic. Where all, where all of Iran's strengths inside and outside its territories are attacked. And so this was in al Qabas, a anti-Israel newspaper saying, Israel is really ramping this up. And so they attacked this base, which was a base of the Revolutionary Guards west of Tehran was most likely attacked by drones late on Friday evening, targeting self-sufficiency research centers dedicated to designing and manufacturing Iranian short-range Iranian short range and ballistic missiles. And I also think drones. Um, but this is an interesting thing that happened here. So this is, this is Tehran. So this is a, a thousand miles from Israel. And just west of, the, of Tehran, there's this Revolutionary Guard space, 
and there is an attack that is launched by drones on the base. But listen to this. This is what's so interesting about this. The sources said, this is the Iranian sources, it appears that the attack was carried out by drones that took off from locations inside Iran and from an area only 10 kilometers from the base, which is considered one of the most important military industrial complexes in Iran. So 10 kilometers is 6.2 miles. So six miles away from one of their most important military bases, these drones are assembled and take off and attack the base and do a fair amount of damage. Um, This is a very strategic base that took place. So understand this, this war between Israel and Iran has ramped up. Again, there are no troops on the ground yet, no fighter jets in the air yet, but there's everything else going on. And Israel's going to continue to do this, whether they have a totally functioning government or not, because this is an existential threat to Israel. So, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the things that they're able to accomplish. So this is a report, you know, it's, it's been in the Jerusalem Post and that sort of thing. But, um, so here's another article in the Wall Street Journal. Israel widens covert actions to rein in uh, Iran. And then there are another report. This is from, and this one is, after years of targeting Iranian agents, Iran, Iranians and Tehran's proxies outside the country in places like Syria, uh, this article says, look, um, Iran has come out and admitted that a Parchin base southeast of Tehran on May 25th that an engineer that was killed there um, was the result of industrial sabotage probably carried out by Israel. And they show the damage and that sort of thing. So um, this Iran has effectively admitted it. And then this is uh, confirming the Israel Ham Om article about this. And then in my research on this, I came across this thing that uh, I can't give you the Persian name for it. It's called Iran Briefing. It's a it's a quarterly. It has a series of publications. And one of the publications here is, well, here's the head part of the article, Three Impossible Conditions, IRGC Publication Strategy to Deal with Israeli Threats. Listen to what this says. The number and amount of blows that the Islam... And now, this is not a pro-regime um, publication. The number and amount of blows that the Islamic Republic has received from the Israeli operation is expanding and has been accompanied by the frustration of the supporters of this system. Explosions, disturbances, and revelations, along with the physical removal of Revolutionary Guards commanders inside Iran and a direct military attack on its facilities in Syria, a part of Israel's crackdown on the Islamic Republic in recent years, which has intensified in recent months. Uh, And so there's some things in this article, and again, it's a translation from uh, Farsi that is not always the great, but uh, one of the sections of the article talks about high economic power, the first condition of deterrence. So you have to make, essentially what they're saying is you have to make it really cost Israel to engage in this kind of deterrence. And, but listen to what this Iranian publication says. In the meantime, this quarterly has considered the condition of the success of the Islamic Republic in adopting the strategy of deterrence of high economic power and acceptable economic growth. This condition does not seem to be possible for the Iranian regime for years, and the dire state of Iran's macro economy has led to the formation of widespread social and economic protests in various cities, the main purpose of which is the religious rulers and the principle of the Islamic Republic. The economy of the Islamic Republic has weakened to the point of widespread international sanctions that have fundamentally targeted the foundation of the system's legitimacy and integrity. This economic famine also seems to have negatively affected the Islamic Republic's support for proxy groups and military issues. So look, Israel's having some success in the war, but this is a Iranian publication. Um, I'm not sure where it's published, but um, 
it, it's saying that this is really having an impact and they're having protests and that type of thing in Iran now to uh, against the regime. And so this is this is a big deal. But the, the flip side of this is that the um, uh, you know that it, it, it it, I think from a Bible prophecy standpoint, I'm speculating here, is that it may cause Iran to act sooner because they're, they're running out of road. They're running out of runway, as they would say in some cases. So this is something that bears uh, talking about. Now, did I say I have two more, three more things? Two more? Well, uh, one of the things that's – some of this I'm going to just have to leave for Sunday – uh, so I want you to be aware of this. I will talk about this on Sunday. Uh, this is something that came up. There's a guy named Shlomo Ben Ami. He was, uh, I forget what his title was. He was somebody who was something in the past. I think he was a uh, foreign minister, uh, former Israeli foreign minister. He's vice president of the Toledo International Center for Peace and the author of a book called Prophets Without Prox- Without Honor, the 2000 Camp David Summit, and the End of the Two-State Solution. So I think you're going to see this. For example, there was a Jerusalem Post magazine a couple weeks ago that talked about, you know, we haven't really gotten anywhere in 55 years on a two-state solution. Uh, what are we going to do? The Abraham, the uh, Foreign Affairs uh, publication of Council on Foreign Relations came out. Uh, just the other last week, I think it's in the current uh, publication, why the Abraham Accords fall short, you know, because we always forget about the Palestinians. We don't do anything for the Palestinians. And so this uh, article in the Wall Street Journal talked about, well, why? Uh, here's a solution. We'll just make the Palestinians part of Jordan. And you're, I, th- I think with the push from the Obama administ- Obama or Biden administration, you're going to see this coming from the United States as well. And I think this is something that might be adopted, but I just want to kind of give you a heads up on it because it's not new. Uh, he wrote a thing called the a Jordan, a Jordan Palestine Confederation. And essentially what he says is we will take the Palestinian parts of Israel of that are in Israel what they call the West Bank and Judea and Samaria, and we'll take Gaza and we'll make that part of Jor- the Jordanian government. Uh, so that that's one of their solutions, uh, and I think this is one they're going to push. But it's not new. As I was researching it, I came across a thing called the Alan Plan, and the Alan Plan, and it's very similar to the Trump Plan that was proposed back in January of 2020. And which I was not a fan of because regardless of how you spun it, this plan, if it had been accepted by all the parties, it would have divided Israel. And that is something that I don't think is tolerable. And so this has a very close, so this is, I believe, the Elan plan from back in the 1990s or 80s. I think it was done under Yitzhak Rabin. And then here is the Trump plan peace plan and you can see that they're essentially the same thing so here on the left you have what was the alan plan to make a confederation so there would be a land bridge across the allenby Allenby bridge and the other bridge to the north of there and it would be tied to um it would be tied to jordan (coughs) And it's just, it's a crazy plan. It's not going to work. Uh, and I'll try to discuss a little more Sunday, but the, the biggest part of it is that it takes the, the crest of the center ridge of the mountains. Uh, the, the Jordan Valley part, except for a couple quarters, would be Israel. And then up to the ri- part of the ri- part way up the ridge would be Israel. Then the ridge line uh, would be the Palestinian part of the Jordan Palestine Confederation. 
the problem with that, Mark Langfan is an attorney, and he's done a, he's done a great job on this, analyzing this. I think he wrote an article 30 years ago in the Jerusalem Post about this. You can find the publication online. If you want a copy, a link to it, I'll uh, or a, a PDF, you can send me an email. And he said it just doesn't work. The main reason is that the ridge line there, it, it slopes towards the Mediterranean, and it is effectively the watershed for Israel. So under this plan, if it was adopted, Israel would give up control of its watershed to the quote, so-called Palestinians. And that's just, that's absolute insanity. It's just not going to work. So talk a little bit more about that, Sonny. And then there's also all of this diplomatic stuff going on, a lot of back and forth. Biden's going to um, Israel and Saudi Arabia in a few weeks. And, he, and he's doing it. it he's, it's humiliating because, because of the sanctions that he's done, because of the ESG stuff that he's put in place from day one we're not producing gas we need gas we need oil so he's going hand in hand to the saudi arabians to try to get them back on board (laughs) (coughs) (coughs) so i'll talk about this but there were some things here um for example um uh mohammed bin salman the crown prince of saudi arabia and i told you that the Saudis have said they won't become part of the Abraham Accords until something is done with the Palestinian issue. And I think that's maintained out of respect to King Salman. I don't know that that's Mohammed bin Salman's position. So he was on a road trip this week. He went to Egypt. Now, remember, a year ago, this guy was persona non grata everywhere because of the killing of the so-called journalist Khashoggi, the Muslim Brotherhood journalist that the Jeff Bezos Washington Post just absolutely lionizes and loves. So, uh, Mohammed bin Salman was, you know, deemed responsible for, no other way to say it, the slicing and dicing of uh, Khashoggi in Istanbul in the Saudi embassy. He was cut up and then I, I don't know where he was distributed to, but he was killed, and it was it was pretty, um, pretty brutal. In fact, somebody gave the nickname to the crown prince Mohammed Bone Salman, is what they used to call him, because of the way that the Khashoggi's body was disposed of. So, but now everybody's coming hat in hand to the Saudis. Aramco is now the most. Uh, the high, most highly value, valued company on the planet. And Saudi Arabia has oil and gas that everybody desperately needs because Russia's not selling to here. They need gas here. We need oil. We've cut off. And it's just, and so the Saudis, through their pushing of the e, um, ESG methodology, social credits for corporations, has greatly increased the demand for its oil. They have the supply, demand, price goes up. They make, they're make they making billions of dollars. So now Mohammed bin Salman is on a tour of the Middle East to consolidate his position. So he had talks with al-Sisi in Egypt on Tuesday, on Monday. On Tuesday, he went to Jordan and met with King Abdul II of Jordan. And one of the things that came out of that meeting was, okay, yes, uh, we want to maintain the Jordanian control of the holy sites, the Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. Uh, Saudi Arabia expressed support for Jordan's role as custodian of the Islamic and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem. Unconfirmed reports over the past few years claimed that Saudi Arabia was seeking to replace Jordan as custodian. I don't think that's a dead issue. That that issue has not been decided yet. But this was what was said diplomatically for the meeting with Jordan. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so they had their meetings, you know, their hugs and handshakes and everything. And then on Wednesday, 
Mohammed bin Salman went to Turkey. Now, this is where Khashoggi was killed. And as someone said that uh, you might not see it in the picture, but Erdogan is walking on his knees to the crown prince. Uh, They had a, a meeting, and it's very interesting the way things are published in the paper. Of course, you see them walking here. Uh, to the fanfare, they went in the big palace there, the 900-some room palace in Ankara uh, that uh, Erdogan built. Probably a bigger house than any one that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has. And they um, they had their meetings. And so here's one of the articles this is from the times of london turkey buries hatchet with saudi prince it called killer so here is uh the i think this is richard spinner writing in the times of london there can hardly have been a more vivid humiliation inflicted on one world leader by another than the drip feed of details of the murder of jamal khashoggi from president erdogan's intelligence agency The world lapped up every tidbit from the bone saw allegedly used by the Saudi pathologist who cut up the body to Khashoggi's last words. Few sympathized with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, whose rise up the greasy pole of royal politics had already alarmed his country's critics. Erdogan was also a problematic friend of the West, increasingly autocratic and a supporter of political Islam. However, admiration of its politics was hardly the reason why the West valued the Saudi relationship. The re- that reason was oil, and a general fear that any replacement for the Al-Sad family might be even worse. Now battered by COVID, economic crises, and the war in Ukraine, the West has decided it craves older certainties. Above all, it needs to replace sanctioned Russian oil, and only Saudi Arabia has the scale of reserves to change the market price. And so the determination of successive presidents to reset America's Middle East policy and its relationship with undemocratic friends has once again been foiled. Excellent article. In fact, if you look at the, the way the, uh, on the right in the Turkish newspaper Sabah, which is one of the ones that Erdogan effectively controls, you see them shaking hands. But the one that was published in the Arab News is to sort of demonstrate the humiliation of Erdogan by the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. This is a very significant thing that's going on, and particularly how it fits in with the Abraham Accords. Now, Barack Ravid, who I do not care for, had an article on Walla yesterday, and he also tweeted about it, and it was about the fact that, listen, there might be more coming, and he based that, on this testimony by Barbara Leaf, who is a State Department spokesperson in charge of parts of the Middle East, and she made reference to, she's going to talk off talk, start off talking about uh, responding to a question from um, a congressman or a senator. Uh, this took place yesterday in D.C. about, can we expand the Abraham Accords? Um, ambassador Leaf. She was the ambassador to the United Arab Emirates under the Obama administration for a while. And uh, this is what she had to say. So she's going to talk a little bit about the Abraham Accords and then listen to what she says uh, at the end of this clip. We thought it would be interesting, and they were both, and they were amenable to working on trilateral um, issues, uh, religious coexistence and tolerance, um, uh, water and energy. Uh, Since then, uh, the secretary host was co-host to a ministerial um, in Israel, um, the Negev Summit, which we are turning into an ongoing um, mechanism, a yearly meeting at the ministerial level of the of the um, of, of uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, Bahrain, UAE, Israel, U.S. We hope Jordan will uh, in- engage eventually. We would like to bring the Palestinians into it. So it is, in the first instance, working uh, across a series of shared uh, cooperative, cooperative ventures. Um, and uh, so we're setting up working groups right now on water, on food security, tourism, health sector, etc. So to deepen those uh, connections, it's an integration piece. I will say now she's going to talk about of, what uh, else is going on. Uh, there. So those are the countries that have relations already, uh, new or old. We are working in uh, the space uh, that is not in the public domain. 
with a couple of other countries. And I think you'll see some interesting things around the time of the president's visit. Okay. So I think that's a direct reference to Saudi Arabia and the agreement that I've talked about, you know, about these uh, islands in the Tehran Straits and the Tehran Straits that uh, Mohammed bin Salman wants to get resolved so he can build his city of Neom. Um, very interesting stuff that's going on. Um, so he 